Poopcast, what up? Today we have a really cool guest. We have our homie Derek Carver. Uh, Derek Carver is a successful strongman, uh, amputee strongman. He lost his leg when he was in the military, which we definitely got into. Uh, we got into a, a, a bunch of stuff about like you know PTSD, um, his experience in the army, and you know some of the dark times. Unfortunately, uh, kind of went to a dark place where he didn't want to explain everything. But you get the gist of it. One thing he did say that stood out to us, uh, one of the many things that he said, and he, he made us laugh literally the entire time. The dude's hilarious. But he said, when something doesn't go right or something doesn't go your way, it's because you're being one of three things. You're either being fat, lazy, or stupid. And, you know, we we, we don't like to associate fat and lazy with people. But when he, when he broke it down and he really explained why he said that, it made a ton of sense. Um, this and uh, so much more. He talked about how to get out of a slump. Um, he he stopped us dead in our tracks. He actually he said something that we like the mics were silent for what seemed like four hours because you know I hate dead air. But um, basically he said you know Mark Mark asked him like hey like w- well what's next for you and he's like I want to become president of the United States and you know <laughs> because he's so sarcastic I think we were just like waiting for the uh, the punchline but he was he was dead serious. And, you know, I, we all respect it. Cause we're like, we're not going to question whether or not he's going to actually, you know, obtain his goal. Uh, the last thing that he left us with, that was one of the, uh, the quotes of the weekend that you guys will see. I eventually butcher towards the end <laughs> of the weekend, but, uh, Mark asked him plain and simply, okay, you know, what, what can we as a society do to show appreciation to our military men and women? And he said, live a life worth dying for. Very, very powerful stuff. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Piedmontese Beef, the uh, the absolute best beef in the universe, like I said on the last episode. Uh, it's more tender, it's more juicy, uh, less fat, cooks faster, and I mean, we, we hit up some amazing steakhouses, and I hate to, you know, it's going to be upsetting because a lot of those steaks that I had were like over $100, but uh, None of them could actually compete with Piedmontese steaks. I know that sounds messed up, but it's true. Um, if you don't believe, I mean, you, you have to just trust me, just go to the website right now. Check it out. Uh, that's Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com at checkout. Enter promo code Power Project for 25% off your order. And if your order is $99 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Let us know what you guys think. Uh, this was a really interesting conversation with Derek Carver. Uh, hit him up on social media. All his links and everything will be down in the show notes or YouTube description. And for now, enjoy the show. Hello. Oh, yeah, that's uh, you. there we go. Wow. I sound old and fat. Yeah, I got, the, I got the old off. filter on again. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. So Nobody's going to understand the word I say. No, Does no one's sound mumbly. No, no. Yeah. I just hope that oh, no one cares. Fine. That's my. You know, I just hope that no one cares about what we say. No, I like that way. No one gets triggered. In fucking downloads, no one's gonna so care. So my knowledge is spread to the masses. There you go. We just hold the mic a little bit closer, and be good to go. Yeah, speaking, yeah. Like, you know, you're really on this guy. He's got a bicep pump. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we're putting a lot of pressure on him. Hey, well, he said guys a million only downloads. Got we got to be able to hear. He's only yeah, got one. Go. He's only got one foot. I said when he walked in, he's like, "You guys don't have a shirt for me." I said, like, "You guys are unorganized." I said, "We're starting off on the wrong foot." He's like, "And I only got one." <laughs> and it's a shitty foot. <laughs> and I was talking about the whole like the whole sh- Columbus situation. Oh yeah, that shit show. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What do you think about the coronavirus stuff going on? God. You don't seem to be that worried about it. <laughs> like, okay, look, I don't want to be the guy that points out the obvious, but like, yeah. one, like, maybe. <laughs> Got to thank for Asians. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Here we go. Um, thanks, communism. See? <laughs> All right, and then just uh, <laughs> hit record now. Would now, be good. We're <laughs> now we're starting. Every Asian follower <laughs> just shit all over the page. Race to zero, yeah. right? Right. Race to zero. Yep. Okay. What were we talking about? I don't even. So this is PTSD. Oh, what's your feeling about coronavirus? Here's the thing, man. It's only killing old people. Yeah. So like, I don't want to be the guy to say it, but like, fuck, man, the boomers are really screwing the country, right? Can we just be honest about this? Like, so if there's a virus that wipes them out, you're not against it. Look, I'm not just <laughs> wasting resources. Do you see? Do you see our national deficit? 
Like we're in debt like every day. Like, yeah, maybe you know, we just like, like the old some people. It's fifty five, sixty five and above. <laughs> Seventy and above. Look, yeah. I love you, I do. <laughs> but you gotta quit running for fucking president. You gotta yeah, quit how, running for office. How old is everybody running for president? Like if you're not 70. eighty, they're not even qual- I want to yeah. know the doctor. Can That's anyone? Who, I want the doctors going. No, he's in good shape. He had a heart attack a week ago. He's good. <laughs> Can anyone even stand up straight? Uh, d- not Bloomberg. No, <laughs> Bloomberg's thumb yeah. when he's giving it. Oh thumbs yeah, up. <laughs> yeah. Very half hearted. Yeah, he can only get half the thumb up. Like and I, like, dude, I can only imagine. Like you're like everybody. If you look at the president, like that's that's fucking horrendous. Like the stress. Like you see, like a guy that has oh, like, it's got to be brutal. A billionaire going in with like with with everything going for him, and then they come out and they just look like a geriatric mess, and their wife is excited about an early fucking payout on like right. life mm. insurance. Yeah. It's uh, and these guys are like 82, 80, 80 when they get out. Like, better get ready to build those libraries quick. Yeah, they're 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 uh, old as shit. Um, I was kind of mentioning uh, before the show started that I you know didn't talk a lot as a kid, and you were just kind of talking about that as well. Yeah. Um, I was pretty shy, pretty reserved. I had two older brothers that did all the talking for me. I usually just I just listened. I didn't talk as much. Uh, are you talkative? Are you introvert, extrovert? Yeah. Where are you on the map? So I don't. Like, it's been weird. Like uh, I always felt like an extrovert. Like, and then you, you know you get blown up, and you're going through these processes, and you're getting into your thoughts and your feelings and things, and then you start realizing like you start paying attention to things. Like the way I grew up was not sexy, so it was more of a reactive life. Like you're, you you respond to situations or you react to situations, and the way I grew up. Um, you know, compared to other people, it wasn't horrible, but at the same time, like, I learned a lot from, like, the bad experiences as, as opposed to the good experiences. Um, a lot of, a lot of moving, a lot of moving to different regions. Um, never met my biological father. So it was like, uh, like the, the test run for, like, the, the prototypical 90s babies. You know, if you want to talk about getting, like, you know, beat or abused, like, and look, it, these experiences are, are, are part of who I am now and why, like, losing a leg is not a big fucking deal. Um, and it's because, like, my mom was, like, she's just an amazing person. So, like, having that in my life, like, has been the one thing that's kind of, like, she's always had expectations and, like, she's never been my friend. And, uh, and like, you know, she's always forced me to do things. And I think her putting me in those situations forced me to interact and engage and develop into like an extroverted type based personality. Whereas like, really, uh, I'm an introvert, man. Like the only reason why I lift weights is like, I've never set out to be the world's strongest disabled man. I'm sure it's like, didn't set out to be the world's strongest disabled man. Uh, like, you know, like I was just always like strong kid. Like there wasn't a whole lot of kids benching in the threes and fours in high school or whatever. And like, you know, um, going to so many different schools and not like in like it, like my life not stabilizing to like halfway through high school where I actually had like a like a click and a group of people and I'm still friends with these guys. Like my friends are like twenty plus. Like Dale King, you know, I've known that guy since I was eighteen. So um, it's that 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 comfort level that, that I don't think people are getting pushed out of and their parents are allowing them to stay in it, and that's causing a lot of the problems. And because of my mom, like, yeah, like, it doesn't mean shit now, but, like, you know, when you're the captain of the football team and you're traveling to, like, Las Vegas at 12 and playing against other states at, like, a at like a national level, like, that's a good experience. And I didn't appreciate it, and I just kind of wrote it off. But now it's like, that was cool, man. Like, I mean, never mind the fact there was, like, porn strips all over the ground and you're 12 and you're like, what the shit? Yeah, <laughs> like Pokemon yeah. cards. Like, collect you those. can legit call chicks to come to your room and be like, I had twenty dollars. Like, where the fuck are your parents? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, just show me a titty. <laughs> She's like, I got twenty dollars. <laughs> did your mom, uh, you know, teach you a lot of discipline because you didn't have you didn't have a Did you have a father figure around? Yeah, so no, no, no. <sighs> No, not not reliably. You know, like like sure, like I had a guy that played the role for like six years, uh, that was like a functioning alcoholic and kind of an asshole. And then I had another guy that like did his best from like when I was like really young to about the age of eight. But 
you know, looking back on things now and seeing them as they were, as opposed to how you remember them as a kid. And like, I, I like encourage people to like, stop being nostalgic about your life and actually like mm-hmm. reflect back to like, not the memories, but the emotions of like that experience. And you're going to help understand, like you're going to learn to appreciate people in your life in a different way because you're going to look at them in a more honest way. Like mm-hmm. you understand, like, you know, I don't know, it's awkward. Like, uh, every kid's probably heard their parents having sex at some point in their life, right? And, like, when you're, like, doing it, you're like, whoa, what the fuck's going on there? I'm going back to bed, fuck it. And now you're like, god damn, what the fuck? <laughs> like, oh, it's probably doggy the way it's just the bed thaws. Like, I'm old enough to know what that is now. And, like, you get those cues and shit that, like, you're, you're like, they'd be like, hey, what's up? And you're like, oh, what is up? And now you're like, oh, god. Like, I hope they're not talking about what I think they're talking about. (laughs) Now I know they are. But now it's like, but at the same time, you understand, like, at some point, we all have to accept that girls poop. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The sooner you can do that and look at it, like, from an honest interpretation, that's like where, like, you start to be able to. Everybody poops. Everyone poops. There's a whole book on it. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) That doesn't mean they can't have their own fucking bathroom. You know what I mean? Or, like, at least over there. (laughs) I don't need to hear it or see it or even acknowledge that it exists. I mean, I know it's, I've never seen a million dollars. I know it's there. Mm-hmm. No, I haven't. It doesn't mean I want, you know. <laughs> you know, what you said there in terms of like looking back at the emotions, I think it's also kind of falls in line with like realizing, because you don't, uh, when you're a kid, like your, your parents, your parent is like a superhero. You know what I mean? But when you, when you get older, like you need to realize like they were also a human and they had massive flaws. You know, like I've, I've had talks with my mom and my dad and he's in Nigeria, but I just understand like they did the best with what they had and they are flawed people in many different ways. But it's as an adult, when you can see that, you can understand that it changes the relationship a lot. So that's super important. Yeah. Um, I, I'll go one too. like, I think we have to accept as a society that like you grew up with your parents and you said <laughs> your dad was in Nigeria. Yeah. My, my, like my dad wasn't there. It was my mom. My right. Mom your me. mom. So like, yeah. I think we have to accept that like there's an entire generation or two of men raised without real male, male role models. Yeah. And then like, you also got to re- realize we're all born in the early eighties and on. And then you have the rise of the women movements, first gen through the seventies and the stuff. So like, we haven't been equating the sexes. We've been emasculating men and propping up women to the point of men don't mm. even feel obligated to be men anymore. Like your sole purpose, like everybody, you look at it, white, black, indifferent, like pre 19, whatever, 50, like mm-hmm. there was always a father. Yeah. It didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And at some point we allowed as a society to emasculate the male population and pose feminism and then, you know, court rulings and judicial preferences and biases and the push for nature and the mothers that like everybody has a friend of a friend and these horrible experiences. And the truth is, is like, just look at science. Two family household. Like I'm I, like, I don't, I don't care if it's two dads, mm-hmm. two moms, I, like there needs to be two fucking mm-hmm. people. Yeah. And like, until we take accountability and responsibility for that, we're going to continue to have these problems. We're like, Hey man, like, you, me, we, we all probably have similar, like, like things that got us into this path where we're all where we're at. And I bet a lot of these experiences, like, no one goes, man, I had a really good family and like shit went exactly the way I planned. And like, man, I coasted through Harvard and then I was like, fuck it, I'll go to Yale. And here I am, like, <laughs> six figure job and I'm breaking world records. And you know, like, my Instagram model is like not a gold digger, bro. My life's fucking amazing. <laughs> no, one wants, no one wants to read that fairy tale. We got Disney movies around that shit. You're like, you don't want to, you don't want the legs. Just keep the fin. It's going to get weird in 2020. Don't worry about it. Mermaids are in. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, I want to go catch a unicorn and just say to me, like, take Dana. And you're like, gotcha. <laughs> Uh, how do you like uh, i guess show like empathy towards somebody who's like you know because we see it all the time where someone's complaining like oh I, I i was dealt a bad you know deck of cards my dad wasn't there for me how can you flip that on its head and be like well no dude like this is like a, a really good opportunity it sounds like shit right now but understand that like that story you just said doesn't actually exist I've accepted the fact that no matter what we do in life, no matter how far we advance in science and technology and how much we're able to overcome, no matter what we do as a human species combined, we are not going to save them all. 
that's a great way to look at it. I mean, I run nonprofits for a living. We feed homeless people. We work with special needs children. We work with amputees and disenfranchised and poor minorities in Newark, New Jersey, and like, you know, poor white Southern trash kids that can. It's, and like it just exists it doesn't matter what you do like I grew up in Southern California like for a point in my life I, I lived 200 feet from the, the border of Mexico and my trailer was on the last stop in San Ysidro on the rail and the backyard was the train tracks and I remember the helicopters and like it's weird but like I still pay attention to what shoes are hanging on wires and how I walk to class and at what time and like it's because there's only a handful of white people and like, you know, I don't know if you guys ever know Chula Vista back in the like early 90s <laughs> or like, I don't know, like look it's up. fucking dangerous, yeah. Uh, like the Antelope Valley and like these aren't like the horrible areas, but like Antelope Valley was like the meth capital of the United States for like a decade and we had like poppies that grow wild. I mean, that was never insane, right? Shout out to Afro man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, who can can't forget him? <laughs> Extremely underrated, by the way. Man, I, I just don't think pre- people appreciated marijuana until recently. So now it's like mm. having a resurgence. Yeah, because like N plus we're tired of like whatever music's become. It's like, <laughs> well, because people only know Afro Man from that 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 one song. But if people listen to that whole album, it's actually really fucking it's, good. It's a really whole good. like song after song. Yeah, like, it's sublime. Like you got like two good <laughs> albums. And, so like, you uh, you just said you can't save everyone. Yep. Um, how do you not lose faith in people? And then what has made you like run a nonprofit to help a lot of people that may be in a position where they kind of are giving up hope. You know, why not just kind of say, fuck it, can't, I can't save everyone, so why even bother to do anything about it? Um, even in the nonprofit community, I'm not saving everyone. I'm saving those that are willing to work and willing to understand their opportunity and willing Got to it. take advantage of, like, the chance to, like, improve their life. If I'm not giving money to people that are just continuing to perpetuate the problems that put them there, I'm not taking athletes that feel sorry for themselves and taking them on fishing trips or hunting trips or, and look, I'm not taking away from anybody that is doing that because I think there's a huge role for that. And just because it's not my thing doesn't mean it's not somebody else's and it's not helping them or it's not saving their life. Mm -hmm. But like that being said, like when I help somebody, I want to give them a tool that's going to help them every day of the rest of their fucking horrible life. And I don't mean that horrible, but I mean, like, let's be honest, man. Like, I didn't, nobody grows up saying, I hope I get blown up in Afghanistan so I can be disabled and win a world championship. No, there might be a motherfucker out there trying to cut a leg off to get some attention, and we know who you are. <laughs> Wait, whoa, whoa. <laughs> For real. Okay. So anyways, so I digress. And, like, these, the, dude, you, we had a guy show up to a fucking strongman competition that was missing a fucking finger that thought he was eligible. He's like, I'm missing a fucking thumb. It's like, okay, cool, man. Like, that's an important finger, and I'm sorry you couldn't jerk off for the better part of your teenage years. Or you couldn't your suck your hand. thumb. <laughs> right. Like, that was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I, uh, fuck you. You need to be missing yeah, a lot more than even, that. Fuck you for even trying, bro. Oh, like, yeah. talk about, like, just, like, I, like, look, bro, I'm a soft six, hard five, and I shoot for nines and tens all the fucking time. <laughs> Like, I go out of my, I'm like, hey, like, they're like, who, who the fuck are you talking to? I'm like, you bitch, like, what's up? They're like, Jeez. not really. <laughs> <laughs> or like, tall chicks, like, I'm sorry, you gotta be this tall to ride this ride. I'm like, that doesn't mean I can't sneak on. <laughs> doesn't you, mean you can't you ask a couple even, questions. You, you never stole a candy bar out of a store in middle school? <laughs> you didn't get that little rush for a moment? Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, and like the bottom line is, Mark, when you come to this, like, I'm not trying to force change. I'm giving the opportunity of change. And like, there's things in our, like, you know, uh, you know, everybody knows my family. Like, I, Terrence is my brother. Like, I love that kid. Like, his, his kids are like my kids. And, you know, he married Amanda and I love her. And like, they're, uh, he's, he's, he's black and white and she's white and like, seeing him and like we went to like i moved to michigan and then he followed me out from california and like we've basically spent our lives together and seeing how he's interacted and like how people are treating him and like what and it's like i get there's a problem i do i've seen it like man um 
it sucks, but I've also been like that kid that like there's a handful of white kids in a school of minorities and like I get it. Like it's both ways. And the sooner that we realize that, the sooner we can get past all of the bullshit and just start solving real problems. And then it won't matter as far as like what nonprofits are doing, like the government solving problems they shouldn't be solving. Like I don't care about affirmative action. I'm disappointed that we even need a law that says that. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's how I think we need to start fixing these problems. We need to start, start and I'm not saying that there's not situations like we're in education stuff where we Yeah, need that to, has to do with, cult, yeah, cult, we have cultural issues yeah, that like you try the, to put the, laws on it. Right, and you just have really to work. honestly sit down with people and have a real, like, like everybody's a little racist. And what are you looking at the black yeah. for? You know what I mean? Because the, the, go to, uh, think about the 90s riots. Everybody's like, oh, the black people riot. I was like, oh, no, there was a lot of Koreans and black people. <laughs> like, there was some animosity that you guys, it wasn't Rodney King. Like, everybody's like, it was Rodney King. I'm like, I don't know. The Koreans came out real rough out of that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and like, and that's because there's a lot of pent up frustration within communities that aren't being addressed that we know exist that help make this country go around that deserve every right and opportunity that, every other person in this country has, but they've been forgotten, left behind, or marginalized, and it's sometimes it's society's fault and sometimes it's their own fault. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that we have to accept before we can even begin to address. Like, everybody knows the VA system is destroyed, but nobody's finding real ways to fix it. Like, we can't even digitize the thing, and it's been like, what, 10 years? I mean... People know what the answer is, but instead of addressing real problems, we're creating things that we can solve because they're easy and we need that that like or that follow mm-hmm. or that immediate gratification of, we said hanging people's bad. It's like, fuck, man, it's 2020 and you guys just caught on to that bandwagon? <laughs> But we, and then like we've got congressmen and senators, and everybody's acting out, and there's no just accountability anymore, or there's accountability only for our side, or and like the fact that we have sides, like fuck, man, we're all just oh man doing the best yeah. we can to provide everything we can for ourselves and get all of our needs and some of our wants, and everybody wants their kids to have an opportunity to do better, mm-hmm. and like that's just called being human. It seems like it seems like uh, to me that you have you've went through so many different things that it just appears, and I don't know you that well, but it appears that you have just kind of buried a lot of feelings that you may have had at some point, or maybe you worked them all out, you know, at some point in your life because you went through so many different things. Do you have, do you think you would have to go, you have to go through those hard times like that in order to kind of get to where you're at now? Cause you seem like, uh, you seem emotionless, which I think is, I, I think is actually a really awesome uh, character trait but without going through all the different things that you went through i don't know if someone could kind of get there you're probably not very reactionary anymore no I, so, uh, to be honest man I'm, i like it's a daily process people think that just because you've identified a problem means that you've solved it or just because you've made progress in an area it doesn't mean like i didn't wake up like <laughs> it's always the it's the iceberg reference or i didn't wake up a world champion you know what i mean i didn't climb the mountain in a day so like it's just uh, it takes about ninety percent of my 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 brain power to not punch stupid fat or lazy people in the face. Like I I, I count like all of our problems in the world to being people to be to be to people being fat, lazy, or stupid. And I don't mean that in like a derogatory sense. I mean if there's something wrong in your life or if there's something that you're not happy about, it's probably because you're being fat, lazy, or stupid. Like oh I wish I wish I ate healthy more. Well every time you don't, you're just being fat. Or you're being lazy, or you're just stupid. And like, as soon as you accept one of those three things, then like, you can then make a legitimate decision to continue that or change it. And like, I get asked a lot, like, what's your motivation? What's your sponsorship? Like, how do you feel like you have to go through those experiences? And I'm like, absolutely not. I don't think you have to have like my experiences to have my perspective. But what I think you have to be able to do is be intelligent enough to understand that like your perspective is unique and other people have their perspective. And you can be empathetic in the sense that I don't know what it is to be a jacked, really good looking black dude. Like, yeah, can we just be that for a I, day? Like, I mean, like could you just day, bless dude, us just, so we can try you know, it? The first thing I do, I just immediately run to the bathroom and see if it's true. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, I he, now, he's told us if we swallow, uh, I think it was Nigerian semen. 
But yeah. it has to be a lot of it no, that we could get, get the experience. A gallon a day for a week, and you trust me, you're going to be. That ain't that much. I mean, that's really a not gallon that is a lot. Of okay, stuff. I put okay, out anyways. like I only so I did in vitro fertilization while I was first injured because of the, some of the injuries that I have for veterans. Mm-hmm. So like you know we used myself as a guinea pig. So I learned a lot about that process. <laughs> about like uh, you know you don't uh, you don't become a subject matter expert in, in vitro fertilization without doing some, some <laughs> semen measurements. So I have an issue called low motility. So basically. I shoot a bunch of blanks still there everything's normal it's good normal range is like one to like four mils or i don't know someone's gonna quote me like that's five I'm like, oh. <laughs> sometimes i read the comments uh, <laughs> <laughs> but i shoot like twice as much as a normal dude with no sperm so like i like there's that phase where you're like you know <laughs> In your late twenties, realizing that you're just roping for days, you know. So, I remember I had set a personal records for yourself. I had a friend one time say, "Like, know. man, don't you hate like you know when you're whacking off and you, you it ends up going on your face?" <laughs> and my, my other my other friend goes, no. "Going on your face?" He's like, "I'm lucky if I hit the back of my knuckles." <laughs> A, I'm just proud you got that kind of distance. That first one, though, because if you... Never mind. So, anyway. Yeah. Before this. Uh, totally depends on how you're aiming it, I guess. No, I mean, there's, you gotta like, be there's tricks. You gotta, you gotta like... No, there's... <laughs> and you're like, I'm sorry, I didn't do that. <laughs> like, keeping a score. Kind of throw it at yeah, the end. Yeah, they're like, what the... Fuck? Like... This is all real. People are writing this down, I bet. Oh, God. Like, I'm. People are taking notes. I I can't wait to read the comments after. Like, the day this gets released, like, you're a chauvinist. Like, the guy raised by a single mother that he watched sacrifice her entire life to ensure that he had a future. Yeah, I probably probably don't appreciate women. (laughs) If you mean, I don't cater to your feelings because you're a fucking stranger and I don't care about anything going on in your life because I don't know you or we don't interact on any level. How did you uh, how did you get into the military and maybe why? I honestly just all I remember is like in third grade, you know the the, the brown. You were one of those guys early uh, on. I, I, so I think like I've said this, and I'm not. I, I'll never take responsibility for quoting it, but I'm sure I, I like. I'm just too dumb to fail. Like I know there's variations of that, but I've never like people have always said like, "Hey, this is hard," and like, oh, well, we'll see, and then like. You know, like, and like, I've never really had a plan. And I know that sounds horrible, but it's I think been, this is a book. Too dumb to fail. <laughs> too, Boom. Well, it's like, I've never had a plan, but I've always had a general idea. Like, I'm a planner. Like, I've, I've thought, hey, this happens, this happens, this. Like, I, I, I don't know if people overthink as much as I do. Like, sometimes I feel like I have like Elon Musk syndrome or like, it's some the mix between old school where Frank the Tank answers that question against that crossfire dude. Like, I don't know what happened. And he like ranted off about industrialization and agriculture in the world. Like sometimes I feel that like I do that with my life. Like I lose like two years and it's like, hey bro, like thanks for everything you did with in vitro fertilization. Like working with the administration, you're like, huh? I guess I should put that on my resume. <laughs> So, like, I don't really have a plan. I think there's a point where now I'm, and I think what you bring this full circle back 25 minutes to your original question, the experiences I've had have offered me the opportunity to touch out to the veteran, to the fitness, to the LEO, to the first responder, especially with 9-11, bringing a lot of that together. Like, I got more visits from the New York Fire Department and Jersey firefighters and police officers when I first got blown up than I did by anybody else. Like, all my Army friends were still deployed. My family was, was very, very small. And, like, I had firefighters. I had grandmothers of Vietnam vets. I had veterans. Like, it was amazing to see that community come together. So that's why, that's what I think helps me maintain some of this faith is like, it seems stupid, but I'll be in the gym and I'll just watch an inspirational video. Not of some guy lifting weights of like, you know, like somebody doing something that's like selfless for themselves and society without people realize like there, there's that commercial where like there's a kid stealing medicine from a pharmacy mm-hmm. and the guy catches him. And like the this guy across the street sees him getting beat, and he walks over and he asks him what for, and he goes, "Is my mom sick?" And the guy gives him rice, noodle, food, and pays for the medicine and sends him home. And then like twenty years later, like the dude's like cooking in the kitchen. He's obviously older. He collapses. He just rushed to the hospital, and then like like the bill's like four hundred thousand. So like. The, the restaurant's closing and then like this this guy the, you know have you seen I've it and seen the doctor the pays one, the bill right? yeah, yeah. and he like mm. 25 years later the doctor that he gave food for to save his mom paid his bill and said mm. you never know when it comes and like I believe in that 
Like, I, you know, like, regardless of what religion you are, regardless of who you are or what you do, like, there's, there's something. You know what I mean? It could be the same thing. It could be some variant. We could all be right. We could all be wrong. Mm-hmm. But if there's one thing, it's that we're all here. And, like, whether we understand this consciousness or not, like, we're all having our experience of whatever is happening. Yeah. So why not make it a positive one? Like, think about all the self-imposed stress. Like, think about what you've done. Like, you, you and I are the same, man. I played football at 310. Like, I was, like, I, I lost all my weight doing carnivore before, like, in 2005. I Eat lost meat. 110 pounds in six months. Jesus. I went to the gym twice a day. I drove 25 minutes to the base. I'd lift weights. I'd run. Wow. I started at 310, quitting playing football with being, like, athletic, where I ran my first, and I, I just left a line of chalk. And then the next, and my goal was to run two miles and the military time standard. And it took me, like, and I was doing it, like, with, and I just What's went that, out with that, 14 marks. minutes or something like that? or I ended it? up getting around 14 minutes, two miles. 13 was the max. So, like, my PT, like, I'd max push-ups and sit-ups in, like, a minute. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you do the run, and I'd always be that guy. Like, regardless of what sport it was, regardless of how I've always had this thing with anxiety and throwing up before mm-hmm. the event. So like, <laughs> so, like, I was, like, I'd be, like, the captain the football team were like on like the east west game and the game would mean nothing it's like some all-star game in high school i'd be like Whoa! Up real quick. <laughs> like get it out like rinse it and they got to the point where like my team would cheer for me or people would expect it <laughs> get the bag so, yeah, yeah, it's always before the event so you'd always see me like crushed in quick calories and sugar in real fast yeah so it was like that but like i don't think you have to have horrible experiences to be empathetic i think it's the way people choose to use their empathy i think people often confuse or conflate empathy and sympathy and then like feeling sorry like don't feel sorry for me like i love my life like is my life great no is my life hard yes is my life harder than most people's probably is it harder than most people's in the world absolutely not like if you're going to be disabled be disabled in america be a disabled veteran in america you know what i mean like i like i I am very thankful for the problems I have because of the perspective I've had and I've gained. Like, I've seen people struggling. I've seen single moms make too much to qualify for their kids' insurance, but because of their special needs, uh, they have to pay out of pocket. So even though they make $70,000 a year, they're spending $2,000 a month just on, mm-hmm. their kids, on their kids' treatment. So, like, maybe we should start reducing your kids' insurance policy from your income and then basing your eligibility for benefits. Like, and then we start addressing, like, long-term benefits versus short-term benefits. Like, and these are simple fixes that, as a society, we're just not doing because we're going to marginalize somebody, we're going to victimize somebody. Like, I understand that, but at the same time, no matter what we do, that's going to happen. So what we do as a society is we come together, we set a minimum of our expectations. Why don't we have state and federal institutions? for homeless and mentally ill. Like, we know they're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. We know they shouldn't be out in public, but we'd rather justify them shitting on a sidewalk than picking them up and putting them in somewhere that they would at least be safe. Sure, they're being detained. Sure, they're in in an asylum and state run. And you know what? It may not be the best care, but it's better than no care. Mm -hmm. And it's something that nonprofits can come behind, rally behind, because this is something that impacts our society on a monumental level. We're not addressing issues. And like, and, 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 and I'm sorry, I go off on rants and tangents. Awesome. Coming okay. full back around, you don't have to have the experience. You just have to choose how, you, how you're how you going to apply your empathy. I'm not going to apply my empathy and enable a problem to continue. I think it's disgusting when people just continuously take advantage of a situation there. And, like, yes, I feel sorry for myself sometimes. Yes, I hate the fact that I'm an amputee sometimes. Yes, I look at people and think, man, what a waste of fucking life, talent, and potential. But that's... I don't know what they're going through, man. Maybe I think that, everybody thinks most of those thoughts as well. Like some, right, like totally uh, normal thought. And, and even just uh, not being an amputee, like sometimes you just hate being yourself. Mm-hmm. Like you just would rather do so. Like I don't think that anymore. I'm older, so I don't yeah. I worry about it as much. But like, yeah, I think even, you know, when I was in my 20s and stuff, you just kind of like sometimes every once in a while the thought crosses your mind that you wish you were just somebody else. Right. I wish I was just not in this body. I wish I was more like him or more like that guy. Yeah. And I, I think there's, I think when you're, in a, and I'm getting to the age where I'm like 36 now, so I'm aging out of like i could tell i was done competing when i was in a gym and i'd see a dude do something like i can do that but <laughs> <laughs> i knew i was ready to compete now i'm in a gym i see a dude deadlift i'm like he's mm. getting it <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah and then i go back to like crawling my 20 pound i don't have yeah, yeah. shit to prove to nobody i'm just trying to look good naked right <laughs> and then i'm gonna eat this cheeseburger um why'd you get in the military i was like 
third grade drawing on that brown paper that you would write your alphabet. And uh, it said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you draw a picture. And I said, I wanted to be an army ranger. And I drew a picture of a stick figure with a gun. Mm-hmm. With no understanding of what it was. And, like, I, you know. Teacher's I just, like, this kid's crazy. Yeah, the teacher's like, here we go. Like, calm down. <laughs> in the 90s. Oh. oh, man, we covered all the bases. We haven't even had abortion yet. Um, <laughs> so smortion. <laughs> we'll just edit that one out. No, we're good. Homer Simpson. No, I mean, there's some things I'm just, I, like, I don't care, but at the same time. Um, <laughs> Maybe you care. Maybe you don't. Right, that's Who what knows? I meant by the comment. Like, I'm not gonna, like, I'm not gonna skip down that path. I'll fight. I'll go down at kicking and screaming. But that's not the vibe we're at. Um, and as you got older, like, what kind of uh, drove you to really? Go, I mean, because to think about it when you're kids, one thing, but to actually go through it. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is, a lot of it, dude, is just setting goals and then having standards for yourself. And like, I'm not driven by anybody. It's all internal. Like, I, I call it like the limitless factor. And, like, if you've ever seen the movie, there's a line where Bradley Cooper says, like, somebody asks him, like, hey, what's it like if, you know, you don't, when you take it? He goes, it makes your brain function where if you don't feel like you're actively making progress towards your goals, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's, like, painful. Like, you feel like you're dying. And, like, I deal with my PTSD and all my TBI and going through all of that and I'm very much aware that I'm a very momentum-driven person. And the minute I lose momentum, I slip into, like, a self, like, imposed, like, depression. So, like, it's not that I'm overwhelmed or busy because now you're managing it and it occupies time and space and and how you operate. But it's it's about, you know, setting an alarm on your watch to take one minute of deep breaths. It's about learning. I meditate every day. I wake up in the morning at 5.15 if I sleep in. And I'll stretch, I'll do fasted row, I meditate, I'll do all my body stuff. And it's for no other reason that it's, fuck, it's peaceful, it's quiet. Like, all that matters is whatever I feel. And, like, I just get it out, write a list for the day. Do I spend three, four hours a day doing therapy, learning how to walk for the fifth fucking time as a grown-ass man and a world champion athlete? Like, I... <laughs> 10 years of body mechanics and like it's um, at the point where you were when you started going down this path where it was it wasn't about competing or being strong anymore it was about like quality years of the life that you have left and like that's where I'm at now and it's uh, I just want my body mechanics to be right I want to be strong enough to feel comfortable in most situations I'm okay being a little bigger but I don't if I had both legs I'd be like 240 and like I'm pudgy you know what I mean like like I can get down like I'm two I'm like two oh five right now. I can get down to like a, a manageable one eighty, one ninety, and that's still a big that's like a two hundred and twenty, two hundred and thirty pound guy. So and that's a comfortable weight for me. So it's just about like getting to those goals and like finding the motivation with actual life. And that's where it's at, and then you really have to be self aware for that. You have to have those hard decisions. I suggest that everybody writes out everybody who they think their friend is. Who's your friend? Who's your who who and then you start actually like looking at that and think how many times have they let me down? Like everybody like and then like think about it and just look at that list on occasion. I guarantee people start really assessing like these motherfuckers are getting off this list right now. Or how many people would like legitimately <laughs> just make that list and call and be like, Hey man, I just lost my job, I need a place to stay for a week or two or maybe a month. Is it cool? And see what they say. And like, like nah, man, and I'm not never. playing games, but yeah, but you'd be and like you yeah. can you can imagine like, but think about it from their life and what they're doing and what they have going on, and mm-hmm. then you start realizing who the people are that matter, and it's the people who have the most like you that are going through the most similar situation, that are like, and you might have friends that you catch up with, but you know, be cognizant of your present, not your past, not your future, and things will start to make a lot more sense. Have you always been? Has it always been? painful for you to not get better even before oh your experiences God. in the military Unbelievably painful uh, i never felt like i took anything serious in life because i was always too concerned with what would happen like the my angelo poem that comes out like you, about your own light and your, your fear is your own greatness and like um I think the things that were always quote unquote easy, like sports and stuff, where it was a physical manifest, like manifestation of like your, your abilities, it was, it was a lot easier to, for, for me personally to get into because it allowed me to zone out and find my place. So it was like recovering, immediately fell into CrossFit, immediately took it serious, immediately fought for a division, immediately fought for dominance within the community for no other reason than like 
it was my way of coping through what had happened and losing the leg and and then like justifying my 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 abilities given the new limits that I had. Like bottom line is if I'm out walking with one of my nephews and they take off running, like I can't catch them. Imagine if somebody walked up and grabbed them. Mm. So like you want to talk about second amendment rights, like put yourself in my situation. Yeah. You want to talk like, and that's what people aren't doing. So, you know, there's, there's in a different approach, like to, to how you're, you're forced to do things. And my family and my friends understand that like there's limitations and there's things that you have to take into consideration. Um, and have accommodated for it. But like, it's also something that I, as a person have to deal with, like I box every week. Like it's, I meditate. Like I, take time to be as efficient as possible at the skill sets that I know that in a worst case scenario will be useful. Not that I expect it to happen, but you need to be ready for it under your circumstances. You need to be physically ready. You need to be and like, take advantage of what you can. And like, it's, it sounds weird, but it's, it's really how, if you're clean your room, get your shit together and make sure you're taken care of and then start worrying about other people. And the minute you do that in your life, you'll realize you don't have time for other people's fucking lives. You don't have time to, 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 to even like the nonprofit stuff is a way of getting out to help, but like, I'm not solving their problems. Again, it's just providing opportunities. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, do you think maybe like uh, the pain from not getting better comes from just judging yourself too much? Sometimes, but mm -hmm. I think that's like anybody. Like, I mean, ask, ask Mark, like when you were starting your empire, how many nights did you sit around and just self-loathe and doubt? Yeah, not much. Not much. <laughs> kind of just knew it was going to happen. <laughs> so like, it's a personality thing. Mm. I've never gone to a competition expecting to lose. Right. Like I've, I might've had doubts about starting something or, or going early on, but now once I commit it, I'm like, I got in trouble in 2016 for talking shit in London because I didn't show up to take second. And I told him that And every event I won, like it was, I fucking crushed it. Mm -hmm. And I was on foreign soil representing the United States. And I'm, I love the United States mm -hmm. just a little bit. Not all of it, not all the time, but enough of it to know it's better mm -hmm. than everywhere else. And like, you take that attitude and you apply it to what you do. And like, it doesn't matter if you're down to no change or if you're traveling on your own dime. If you have faith in what you're doing, it'll be fine. And that's why I don't stress out about shit I can mm -hmm. control. Because, like, your real passions in life will rise to the top, given the opportunities. And if you don't hesitate and you understand what you're risking and losing and that you're in America, there's a safety net, even if you don't think so. Like, mm -hmm. do it. Because at 75, 80, 90 and you're dying, like, that's your life. That's it. And, like, I've died three times. Like, it's not flashing before your eyes. You're experiencing emotions in my situation. It wasn't, my life didn't flash before my eyes as I bled out in Afghanistan. Like, it was every emotion from being born. Because, like, think about it. Like, people always look at me like I'm crazy. But just the minute you're born, your brain starts functioning. You start storing information. You start processing. You start taking breaths. You start making visual, sound, audio, smell, tactile. All of this data starts rushing your brain, and it's putting it somewhere. Now, it may not be able to process. It's like taking a computer from now to 1950 and giving it to them. You didn't solve a single problem. You gave them all kinds of capability and capacity to learn from and reverse engineer. Mm -hmm. But, like, you didn't solve anything. You just blew their fucking minds. It's like if I took a Ferrari to 1901, I was like, check this out. <laughs> Couldn't drive it. There's not a road or infrastructure for it. Yeah. So, like, think of your brain in childhood like that. You're still having these memories and these thoughts and these processes, and they're getting stored in places, but you're not recalling them because they're not being categorized. So when you die... Your brain's literally soaking up the blood and oxygen from your body and you're feeling your organs shut down systematically because it's going from toe to head. And then it gets to that point where it's struggling between your heart and your lungs. And then that's your brain thinking, fuck. And then when it's gotten to the point where you've lost too much blood, it takes all the blood to itself. And what's it do in its last act? The most selfish thing it can. It releases all of your dopamine and serotonin. So you start getting back every positive emotion you ever experienced. So why wouldn't you have those emotions from birth? Like that's your first, that's the first bond with the first human that you've ever had without acknowledging it. Like science has proven that there's a chemical reaction of the babies and their mothers. So why wouldn't you experience that emotion again? 
and then run that through your whole life. And I know we're running short on time. Run that through your whole life. And when you start making decisions, understand that you're not making decisions for the memory. You're making decisions for the emotion. And I think if you learn the emotion and the importance of emotions in life, and then you learn that like your emotions are reflections of who you are and your own personal happiness, I think then you'll start actually living a life that you're more comfortable with. And when people call you an asshole or stare at your hand tattoos or stare at your prosthetic or make inappropriate comments about your dick, you can make a smart-ass comment back or a joke or tell them it's longer than your leg. <laughs> oh, emotions are, you know, they're, they're just... Uh a byproduct of interpretation. Right? Yeah. Well, we're just constantly processing. You mentioned a lot of key things right there. You're processing information and problem solving. You know, that's really who the fuck knows why we're actually here. Mm -hmm. But while we're here, that's what we're kind of here to do. So you can manage a good, strong life without feeling all fucked up about and, it. And man, time. I tell you what, Mark, you've, you've you, like you, without realizing it or not, like I've been following you guys for basically my entire career. And Jess has kept me in the loop with you guys. And like, like a lot of things that like I, I like I call it the fat boy culture. Like me, you, Matt Vincent, Brandon Lilly, like even you know Brandon Allen. Like there's a couple guys out there that are like in that transitional phase at the end where they're trying to figure it out. And it's hard because you identify with your sport and your body and your strength and like your self esteem is rooted in that. And like I know that because I've seen you and get and I've and like I've followed it and to see you kind of like. Watching you and the early on fat guys kind of make that transition is making it easier for the rest of us because now we have a framework that wasn't there previously because in the 80s and 90s, athletes weren't transitioning well. They were going into drugs, they were going into bad decisions, and they weren't finding positive outlets. And I think social media has helped, but at the same time, like it also is something that I'm sure that you, myself, you have to fight that constant fucking demand and that feed for. So like... Don't sleep, like, dude, you're showing me, like, I might do the carnivore again, I don't know, like, I love carbs, and I'm, like, I don't want to be that disciplined, but, like, watching you do it, and then, like, I talk with, you know, Matt Vincent a lot, and, like, it's just, you guys are, like, you know, you're the, you're like the OG for the fat boy community at this point, man, you so know. keep it up, it's, it's, it motivates me, because I'm like, man, if Mark can do it, and, like, look that good, I could maybe get halfway there and be all right. You said you died three times. What exactly did you mean by that? Like, oh, he, like, like dead. Not just now, right? No, no. <laughs> like, uh, so I bled out the first time. Flatline. Is that, is that your leg? Yeah, yeah like, and all three times were in conjunctions with, like, and then, like, my mom tells a story about I was born with umbilical cord around my neck, which mm -hmm. would have been four, but I don't count that, so. Mm. It's like I was, like, a, fucking 10 pound baby and she was like a 105 or 110 pound woman wow so like i like Shit. fucked her <laughs> like that's why i have such love for it and like she used to throw it in my face like you know you were 10 percent, 9 for 11 percent of my body made a bro like, you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> so why not them hips a little bit good thing now because like that's all in style <laughs> like in the 80s they didn't appreciate it i was laying groundwork for that booty game mom you're welcome oh my god no, mom, I love my mom. Like, my mom is, like, my mom's my hero, man. Like, she, my mom's the nicest person in the world, too. Like, I have ex-girlfriends and friends that still talk to my mom. They're like, oh, have you talked to something? I'm like, no, have you? That? Like, oh, like, what? what walk, we don't have that many people that have been blown up before, so can you kind of walk us through what somebody else told you happened or what, what happened or um, how it went down? It's, you know... I was on a dismounted patrol with my soldiers in Afghanistan in 2010. And, uh, you know, you get, you, you spend time there and you kind of, uh, learn the people and the culture and kind of the triggers and the warnings and you kind of know when it's coming. And like, I was one of the least experienced guys there. Like most of the guys on my platoon had already deployed. I was an officer there enlisted, you know, we, the, the, you know, there's the typical platoon, um, you know, dynamic that everybody's dealing with and, and leaving for a mission that you expect contact on. Um, there's only so much you can do to mitigate risk and, and, uh, and then just get ready to do your job. And I think, uh, everybody was expecting it. So when it happened, it was just a, a more of a individual type experience from there. Um, 
you know, everything. Is it like a landmine or what? Uh, so it was a command wire IED to 107s. And 107s are like Chinese 107 millimeter rockets. Um, and, you know, like you have your moment. You blow up and your, your training kicks in. It's amazing how well trained that we are as soldiers because it's instantaneous. And everybody does their job and everybody does what they're supposed to do with or without guidance and it works out for the best. So, you know, losing two soldiers and having nine wounded and then having another commit suicide and like, you know, having to deal with, um, you know, being the person in charge and planning the mission and setting, like, it's just... um, anybody can tell you about their personal experience of getting blown up. Like the first thought I had was fuck you. You got hit by an IED and like, I'm doing somersaults through the air. So like when you're landing and like, you're like yell IED and it's like, you're 40 feet in the air. Yeah, they know. So like you have this internal monologue, that's what it's like. And like, it's just like any situation It slows down. That's the training aspect. Like oddly you're comfortable with everything because it is what it is. Like, I grabbed my own leg and drug it in my lap. And my rifle was too far to grab. And it's just, like, everybody does that. Like, that's instinctive because that's what happens. And, like... You don't panic. You're just like, oh, there's my leg. I mean, you might, but it's not going to solve anybody's problem. And if, you know, a dead platoon leader is a bad day... Like, if you panic or you fuck up or your NCOs or your guys aren't ready or they don't step up, like, a dead platoon's a, a significant loss to a battalion. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Everybody does their job. And, you know, I try, like, I'm not a very humble person in life. It's the it's the storytelling and stuff, the experiences. Um, I remember... I remember everything. I never lost consciousness, but like, you know, the medic runs up to you and, you know, your priorities are different than his priorities. So you're literally getting into arguments, whether your dick still works or how's it look. And he's like trying to save your life and you're trying to check out if your dick's still there. <laughs> like they don't want you to look down and like you're 240, 50 pounds. <laughs> Like, you have these interactions with people in the moment where, like, you learn real quick what your priorities are in life. And, like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, is my dick okay? Like, he runs up and he's like, shit, sir, I didn't know you were a hit. And it's like, how's it look? And he's like, I got to put a tourniquet on your leg. And you're like, well, no shit, I just drug it in there. And then, like, grab him and pull him to your fucking face. And you're like, how's it look, doc? Give it to me straight. And he's like, you're... Your uh, your leg's gone, sir. And I was like, I don't give a shit about my leg. How's my dick look? And like, Doc tears open my pants. He's like, Your dick looks good, and your balls are fucked. I was like, I don't need my balls. Save my life. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you guys like you prioritize things, and like you kind of like understand that the situation is what it is. And like, once you've kind of been there, and like, there's there's nothing cool about this. Like, that's the thing. Is like, it was a job. Like, if you signed up going in, like, I don't consider. Anything that, like, there's guys that are, like, legit heroes that, like, get purple hearts. But, like, everybody else, like, there's guys that don't get purple hearts that do some heroic-ass shit. And, like, people just don't realize it. And, like, I think that people are always, and this is, like, part of the things that I struggled with, with, like, my thing is my career wasn't what I wanted it to be. Like, I was real insecure about my career. So it was one of those things I didn't really want to talk about or get in depth with. Like, I struggled with things. But it was just, like, everybody else. And you're like, it's easy, real easy to like beat yourself up and like highlight the fact that you're not good at something, but it's hard to give yourself credit for being good at something. So, you know, understanding the situation the way I do now, I mean, fuck man, you, it is what it is. You do, you do your best and it sucks. And like, you have to make peace with it and sleep at night somehow. And like, everybody's got to do that in the world with their own life. And, like, I just tell people, take it easy. Everybody's struggling. And, like, be thankful for your problems. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't go into the story much. I actually haven't told it in, like, five or six years just because I, like, it doesn't – I don't want it to, like, define define me. Like, it's obvious. And, like, oh, details, funny parts. Like, I just – it sucks to have to, like, tell me about the worst day of your life. Yeah. 
you know, and then do it in front of a million fucking people and then get emotional about it. And then like, it's just like, how about this? Tell me what you learned from the worst experience of your life and how does it impact your life still? And how, how has it made you a better person? Like, that's what I want to know about somebody. Like, I don't want to know what happened to you. Like, I don't want to know how many dudes ran through my girlfriend before I started dating her. Like, you know, you just knew it happened. There was probably a couple slut streaks. You do some quick math and you make peace with life and you move the fuck on. You're perpetuating the culture anyway, because then you do your own math and you scare yourself and you're like, fuck, I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and then, so I mean, from this situation then, because afterwards, how did you, how did you, because you mentioned PTSD multiple times. How did you change? 10 years of fucking intensive therapy, still ongoing. I see two psychiatrists simultaneously because I like to play mental games with people. So, <laughs> Dean's like, hold up. <laughs> You're playing chess, dog? I thought we were playing checkers. <laughs> Did you just. Damn. People uh, talk about like seeing things. Is that literally like what it's like? Like you're just driving down the street and you, you know, have. No. Like a, you I, know, is I it mean, anything you, like a movie I mean, or whatever? Like, what is it? Com- uh, how do you describe it? It's different for everybody, man. Like, my PTSD I'll speak specifically to because there are people that struggle, like drivers and TCs, guys that are, like, driving Route 1 and, like, legitimately on IED. Like, I was in a, a, an 1151, which is an, a small up-armored vehicle, and I was never so fucking scared about IEDs in my life until I went from riding in, a, in like, a huge up-armored Mat V into a little Humvee, and I'm like, was that an IED? Like, it's like, man, it could have been a plastic bag, and I was like, stop the car. Yeah. You know, but like in the mad view, you're like, fuck it, go on. I mean, worst case scenario, like, beauty, like, and you downplay. Like, relax, we're in Columbus. Right. Probably exactly. Like, you're safe, bro. But like, no one's going to go for a stroll through certain neighborhoods. Like, I, I love Detroit, but like, I'm not going to go for a walk through Detroit at 3 a.m. Um, yeah. So, uh, I think, um, PTSD plays a part in everybody's life. Mine is mostly, uh, anxiety and sleep. Um, I mean, I sleep like a baby, but it's because I've learned to develop, like, make peace with kind of things in life. And, like, it does, like, nightmares are, are, are a big issue. Um, anxiety, specifically with, like, medical things or, like, uh, like authority, like, uh, overstepping bounds. Like, I just have a problem with, uh, like, communicating with people that aren't even trying to understand. And, like, these are all things that would trigger me. But, like, I realize that, like... Like, I could take the horse to water. It could be dying of thirst. I can put its head in water. I could drown it in the fucking one thing it needs to survive, and it won't matter. So it goes back to not saving a mall. Like, just understanding what you can do and doing your best to impact as many people as you can. And I think then you're actually in a situation to maximize and efficiently use your time. I think too many people waste time. And I don't mean waste in a negative way. I mean saving the unsavable. And, like, every drug addict, like, the dirty secret about Walter Reed is everybody comes out as an amputee. Like, I've had 60 surgeries-ish. Don't quote me. I might have been 59. I might have been 63. But around 60 surgeries. I, I think it's at least 60. Um, and, like, I, I've been addicted to opiates. Like, I, fuck, man. Why wouldn't I have been? I spent nine months inpatient. Like, I had 50-something surgeries that first couple of months. And then, like... I'm on a Dilaudid drip, a morphine drip. I'm taking orals, and then I have a push pump every 30 seconds. And you know why? Because the amount of pain that the average dude that's just had his leg ripped off of his body, his right thigh torn open, his ball sack cut in half from swelling, a missing finger tech, and like a chunk of elbow, plus like, you know, random shrapnel that he's bleeding from on the entire left side of his body at a semi-regular basis. You know, he's going to need some pain meds. Mm -hmm. And then you do that for six months, nine months, and then, like, yeah, no fucking shit. Like, I didn't understand opiates until you're taking 120 milligrams five times a day just to, like, stay awake. And then when I came off, like... The, they baby step you off, which is very awesome, very controlled, very professional, but then you have to take that last leap, and that's on you. And I chose to go cold turkey. <laughs> Three of the worst weeks of my life, but I haven't struggled with this since. And like a lot of guys, it's a box and their alternatives or down step, and then that mentally puts them in a situation where they're still expecting the access. And like, yeah, there's access, but whether you choose a user or not is what's going to, you know, 
and I'm not saying that guys can't use it effectively, but I think long term, like be as natural as possible with like self remedy and understand that life is painful and that there's a certain threshold that you just have to accept. I'm not saying live with pain. I'm saying accept that there's pain with life. Mm-hmm. So that's how I look at my PTSD. It's a part of me. It's something that I deal with. It requires uh, mental strength and oh, there's physical strength, mental strength, and emotional strength. What so. did you uh, What did you learn about? Not necessarily just yourself, but what did you learn about the people around you when you went through that situation? Like, you know, what did you learn about like your mom or some of the people that were close to you at that time? You, you remember you were, you were referencing the friends, you know, and talking about like you know what they would do for you type deal. What did you learn about those people? Uh, it was like legitimately like the third time I've ever seen my mom cry. Like when I woke up at the hospital, um, I was married at the time. My ex-wife was great while I was in recovery. Um, we're still like really good friends. Just getting remarried, um, to a really good dude. Finally. Um, and then like, uh, you know, nothing because uh, like losing my leg didn't define my life or change things for me. And the people that were there were there. The people that came after were hard to sort out and took some time. And, like, I, I didn't realize that social media, like, the... Some even, people are coming to visit you, taking a picture type deal? Yeah, I mean, that was, look, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a wounded soldier. I have a sex, sexy injury. Like, I was at a sexy unit. Like, people wanted a sexy story. And, like, we have a 24 hours new cycle. And, like, I've benefited from it. Like, I'd be an idiot not to say that I haven't, like, you know, speeding tickets or, mm. you know, handies or whatever. But, like, at the same time, like... <laughs> Um, I think you go through it and you just learn that it's like normal for you. It's like chick with big tits, you know, like she knows what she can wear to get free drinks. She knows what she could be wear to get left the fuck alone. And like, she knows under circum, she's going to get stared at. So there's the, like, you just accept it. Like, I'm going to go out and my legs going to be out and people are going to stare. And like, I used to get like annoyed by it. Like, it's not a dick bitch, but now it's like, you know, maybe it is. <laughs> how, how should people, uh, react like uh when they see somebody that has you know like i i don't like throw I, money at them God, <laughs> shocked. Like, took give, it off. To you, give you t- give you 10 bucks i've actually had that happen i took my leg off in portland and i was like sitting outside the hotel just kind of soaking up the city and some dude threw five bucks uh, down by my nub and like walked off you thought like, you were like that i was almost <laughs> wow <laughs> i mean look dude, this is how i dress i get it's kind of bummish not sure sure this is very nice um <laughs> but the t-shirt i walked in and would, you would totally think i was homeless wearing that <laughs> Somebody just gives you five bucks. That's awesome. Um, I know two more dudes and buy a joint. Yeah. As far as fitness is concerned, uh, how like how fast did you get back into lifting and 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 that type of like how, initially how about, like yeah. in 2010 I was like by like within nine to, under a year like I was trying to do body weight dips like rework squats and lifting like I have videos like my ex wife because this was before like I didn't care about the gram like mm-hmm. I started I think in like eleven or something I didn't join until like sixteen. So, like, I went through the whole recovery, like, just on my own, no social media, nothing, like, not even, like, Facebook-type stuff. And uh, and it was, like, relatively unknown, but, like, you know, I did it the way I thought was best without PR. And, like, I remember Weta, and I remember all these guys coming up, like, KC was there. Mm-hmm. And, like, they did it in the u- utilizing social media and, like, defining a niche, and they're crushing it. So, I think... Um, fitness fit into it when i started crossfitting my buddy's gym i was the first um amputee to compete at the arnold in 2013 um in the crossfit competition and arnold happened to actually like walk in at the exact time that i was about to start and like i originally didn't sign up to do it and it was a workout called linda so, like, I was wearing, I was in the sweatpants phase where you don't show your leg in public. So, I'm sitting there, and Dan, Dale King, who I started Team Star with, I mentioned earlier, is like, you need to go out there and compete. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. So, finally, he talked me into it. So, I'm walking out there in pants, and it's literally like they decided to put me right up front, make an announcement. And I'm like, fuck it, I'll just work out in pants, not a big deal. And they're like, he's like, no, you got to take them off. I'm like, I'm not. Like, we're, like, arguing in the middle of the arena without the microphone, and people are, like, gathering. And there was a couple hundred, 
and it was off in the side and like he's like take off your fucking pants i'm like i'm not taking off my fucking pants for this comedy he goes how are people gonna know if you don't have your fucking pants off i was like and like right as i'm saying this the dude with the microphone walks up and like we're friends now he's like i was like fine i'll take off my fucking pants and i pull my pants down and like everybody looks and like Dylan like steps back and i'm like fuck <laughs> So, like, now, like, my leg's out, and a couple hundred people went to a couple thousand people, and then they started to cluster, and then it was, like, over, and then I, like, started the workout, and I was, like, crushing it. Like, it was made for me for about three minutes out of ten, and then I just started vomiting uncontrollably. <laughs> so, but lucky for me, I vomited at, like, the 3.30 mark, and they stopped filming at, like, 3.20. So, like, it totally wasn't. Nice. But I was, like, in a bucket, like, the announcer's holding it, like, my team's cheering. Like, this poor guy, it's like, there's vomit going everywhere, and he's like, take one for America, like, holding the vomit bucket, like, so it's getting on his hand, and it's, like, out of my nose, uncontrollably vomiting. And, like, the oh. dude is just, like, just, like, a champ. Like, uh, Jason Welch up in uh, CrossFit Cadre out of Cleveland area. He, uh, literally holding this bucket, and I'm just, chunk, like, chocks coming out, and, like, ugh. So anyway, like, the, like, I go in there, and I clean myself up, and I walk out, and, you know, like, there was... The, they filled the room to capacity once they had heard what was going on and mm-hmm. Arnold happened to watch and then uh, basically invited me out and then like you know um, you know made a comment about inspiration or something or athlete or disabled person or something and it caught <laughs> on and I wrote for muscle and fitness and men's health and I got into the CrossFit opened a couple of gyms I won the first adaptive water palooza out of Miami and then Whoa. Tried to work with CrossFit Games about getting a sanctioned uh, event there, but got no love back. So then I switched to powerlifting, struggling with squat, you know, not on a Smith. So then, uh, you know, went into pressing shoulders and bench, did that, and then went into strongman, ended up winning U.S. Uh, the U.S. title for strongest disabled man, and then went to Worlds, and then won World's Strongest Man, and then. Um, Ended up getting hurt at a charity boxing match like four months later. Had a surgery, recovered. Um, two weeks out from the Arnold at a charity bench press event. Tore my chest. And so I just, the writing was on the wall. I'm 36. So I just retired and spent the last, had osteo integration. And this is, I'm number like 28 in the world for this program. And just recovering for a few more months and then trying to figure out what's next. Sorry, um, did that answer the question? No, it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. fitness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you say you, you still don't uh, do CrossFit, or you do a little bit for training? Or? I do like functional fitness for training. Like I'm getting to the point now where I think I'll do like a like a compound three days a week, and then like two days of hit like cross functional training, and then I'll do like one day of a, like a like a bro pump, like full body, just to flex in the mirror. What do you think is uh, something important for, uh, like, maybe not even just amputees, but somebody that is just down, like someone who's just, like, they're upset with themselves, they don't want to move. They don't, I would imagine an amputee would get in that situation really hard, but a lot of people just get in that situation. Like, what are so, what are a few things that you tried to make sure that you did every day? Uh, you met, did mention meditating, and I thought, man, that's great because mm-hmm. – Anyone can, uh, you know, anyone can work on meditating. There's like three things that I try to do, like for somebody that's down or depressed. Like one, like be thankful for your problems. Like we've talked about it. Like I know they suck, but like they're yours and you're handling them better than anybody else, especially if you're functioning in the world. I don't want your problems. You don't want mine. Um. This is the PTSD thing where you just go blank. There's three things. Problems. You mentioned meditation earlier. Do you, do you I mean, re- I try to re- recommend that to people? I mean, yeah. I, I tell people to do whatever their their body needs to do. I don't know what the other... I blanked on that. I'm sorry. That's, those are gone. I might remember later and I'll text you. Um <laughs> Uh, meditation helps. Meditation helps me because, like, I think a lot of people get lost in the future or the or or the past, and like, like they're not present. Like, I have to ask myself. Like, my watch goes off, and I ask myself, "How do you feel? Why do you feel that way? Can you do anything to change that? If you can't do that now, is it worth dwelling about now? 
write it down. And like, I think like something to help people go to sleep is write down everything that's in your head, like lay down, shut your phone off, shut your TV off, grab, grab a pen and paper, close your eyes. And if you're like tossing and turning, like get up, turn the light on, like something simple. And then don't use your phone because then you have a screen and then just write it down. And then you have a list of everything from the day before, mm-hmm. like Simple, small, subtle changes will improve people's lives, but they're too busy buying a gimmick or not. Like, our bodies are 100,000 years old. Your entire diet's based on this. Like, you process the way you're supposed to process. Sleep when it's dark. Be awake when it's light. Find your natural rhythm and then exploit it. Be as efficient as possible. And, like, train when it's appropriate to train based on your schedule when you feel the best. Start with the important stuff. That's that's how you're successful. Like, it's not meditation. Meditation might help, but really it's about maximizing your efficiency and the time that you have based on what you want to accomplish. Everything that you do in a given day uh, must take a little bit more time. Everything you know? is structured my day down to the half hour. There you go. And if I need to validate or change, it's made. Like, today I had, might have had to call for a work meeting at 1. So, like, everything's adjusted and switched around mm. and played on. So, like, it's based on like what you want to accomplish. I have to lift and then I have to go hang out and like there's things and you fill in. It's not hard. People just make it right out day, get seven hours of sleep, plan that out and then write all the shit you have to do based on a certain time. And then with whatever time's left, fill in with what you want to do and then just fucking do it. And if you don't decide whether you're being fat, lazy or stupid. Did the military help you like plan better or was this something that you were just, you were just a well. Okay. Yeah. Just like, just military just enhanced it and made it more efficient and made me more, more aware of it. I think it's a personality thing. And I think it's really just what you want to accomplish. Like number two on things like, you know, be thankful for your problems Two, understand that you only get 75, 80 years. Yeah. Like seriously, like there's 2000 weeks in the average lifespan. Well, in your first 18 years, you're locked in school. Right. And then you're sleeping for a third of that. And then you're working for another third of that. So then you have like a third of 60 years if you're lucky. So you have 20 years to do what you want. Deal with what you want. Like, And it takes you 10 life. years to get good at something. And so, I mean, fuck, man. Like, maybe... Longer. Right. I mean, yeah. if yeah, if you're lucky. Yeah. So that's so like really, you're going to have about ten years of productive life and something you're good at, and something that you're doing. Like, stop falling into the same patterns of bullshit that prevent you from getting where you want, and start actually making decisions, hard decisions about your life, and stop creating problems for immediate gratification, and start focusing on long-term goals and change. I'm not working a five-year plan. I'm working a 20-year plan. I don't care about my five-year plan Mm. as long as it fits into my 20-year goals. I'll figure out the third one eventually. I think that uh, it's... We just had JP Price on, and he mentioned how much journaling helped him out, mm-hmm. writing things down. You just mentioned it again right now. I think that everybody listening right now needs to just go to a fucking store and buy a notebook and Bro, start I have writing five. <laughs> Like, I write nonfiction, fiction, I write self, I write ideas, and then I write articles. Like, like writing helps, but it's not necessarily... I think writing helps for decluttering, mm-hmm. yeah. but, like, don't rely on writing to make life easier. Unless you're willing to get five notebooks, because then you're just constantly going back for it. Like I have an ideas notebook, a uh, nonfiction, a fiction, and then you have like your plan, like you know the the dreams and mm-hmm. goals, and then you can just run it out. What do you write in the fiction one? Fictional stuff. Yeah, like what? Well, I don't know, man. Like um, children's books. Oh, okay. Um, comics, like cool, uh, very cool. You know, daydreams. Like, why not? Like, mm-hmm. somebody, like, some dude created Marvel based on, like, shit he daydreamed about when he was 15, right? Like, everybody's got holes, huh? Mm-hmm. Like, how many times can we rewatch Wolverine? How about dark comics, man? Like, how about you get into something, like, where you can actually write, like, some hateful-ass shit and, like, talk about society? And then maybe we'll just call it, like, Animal Farm or something. Yeah, or just, Lord of the Flies. Oh God. Yeah. yeah, you write some crazy stuff that, and maybe it's not for anybody else. 
right? Nothing's been published that like yeah. outside of a magazine, and like uh, I don't, I haven't, I've turned down people to do bios and books. Like I might do like a, I might write a book about like, like approaching life through fitness, like in general, because I don't consider myself an expert in any particular sport. The third thing, just be strong. It's like right on some of your shirts. Like, and I don't mean just physically strong. I mean mentally strong, emotionally strong. Those are my three life goals. Like, um, be strong, mentally, physically, emotionally strong. And make sure that you're not lacking in one because any chink in one fucks all three. You can be physically strong all day, but if you're not emotionally strong or mentally strong, mm-hmm. you're not getting there. You, you're not going to meet like without mental strength, you're not going to peak at physical strength without emotional strength. You're not going to be able to get to mental strength and without putting yourself into hard situations and physically trying, you're not going to improve your mental capacity. Yeah. You have 75 to 80 fucking years. You better enjoy them. Nobody else is going to live them for you. You're not going to die and remember your friends and family. You're going to remember your emotions, focus on your emotions. And then the first thing, be thankful for your fucking problems. They're yours. No one else wants them. No one else is going to solve them. No one else is going to deal with them. A handful of people, like your fucking parents or your spouse, care about your life. Outside of that, they don't fucking care. Like, Mark cares about you as a person, but you die, there's a new dude sitting there. You know what I mean? And that's not because your memory isn't... It's because life goes the fuck on. Yeah. So, like, you have your time. Spend it however you want. I hope you enjoy it because when you die, you're going to have some regrets if you don't. How do you get emotionally strong? Um, and or mentally strong through physical, through physical, through physical, and like so, like if, just learn from those physical things. Because some guys go to the yeah. gym, hammer weights, and they don't really think about it much. Well, and that's 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 that might just be a physical development for them, and maybe like me, meditating is a is a, a means of 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 mental mental growth, and then like. You know, for emotional development, I write because like writing emotions and so you I'm not saying like you don't have to use one to get to the other. What I'm saying is one begets the other. So like you can train them individually, you can train them together, but understand that training two out of three isn't solving your problems because you're going to default to your weakest and be exposed. And I'm not saying you have to be a 10 at all of them. Everybody's got like mentally, mentally and physically, I'm uh, like a nine and an eight, but like mental, like physical, emotional strength, I'm like a six. So like, that's the one that I focus my time on knowing that I'm, you know, a shit brick house or whatever. I'm curious about, um, cause I mean, we've been mentioning the meditation that you've been talking about mm-hmm. for a while, but a lot of guys, when they hear meditation, there, there's so many different types of meditation. Transcendental so, meditation. There you go. Boom. Get your word, get into a spot, and meditate like a boss. Yeah. Clear your mind 20 minutes twice a day. Find a, Allow everything to kind of drop away. And then once you get good at TM, that's when you're used to going to your space. You can literally just learn to mindfulness and start paying attention to your inner self on like a regular basis. Like, And it takes practice. Like, I get good at it, and I get bad at it. And people just got to dedicate to the cause. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The uh, like that the mindset of like you can't save everybody. Did you have that when you first started working with like these nonprofits and stuff, or is it something you developed over time because maybe you got burned a couple times? Yeah, it's something you develop. I think mm-hmm. everybody always goes out with the best of intentions, expecting the best from people because everybody like, oh, everybody's inherently good. Like, no, I'm sorry. Like, I, like think about it. Like, and people are inherently bad. Because people are self, they like they, they care about themselves first. Not because of that's who they are, because that's biologically what they're programmed to do. Your kid's in the middle of the street, his kid's in the middle of the street. You can only save one. Right. See how fucking important your life is all of a sudden? Right, right. So, like, do what's best for you, not disregarding how important other people are, but understanding, like, I'll run into a street for my nephew. I'm not running into a street. Like, I might run into a street. Like, I've ran into a street for a stranger's kid before, but, like, it's not something that everybody, like, yeah. you know what I mean? I, what I wasn't choosing between my kid and somebody else. So, like, it's easy to put yourself in jeopardy. It's hard to put somebody else's in jeopardy. So, like, people say, I'll donate more money. I'll pay more in taxes. Fine. That doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't even offer a real solution. Mm-hmm. Like, because you're what you're not doing is... You're not running in the street, leaving your kid, grabbing someone else's. Mm-hmm. 
And that's why Batman with Joker and Heath Ledger was such a fucked up movie. Right? See how I took it there? Like six years ago, dog. Don't think about it. <laughs> uh, I can't not think about it. Um, how are your um, how are your charities um, helping to potentially solve problems? Like what what like what were they created out of? So Team Star came from the Team Arm, What? What's Team that? Some Assembly Required. We started with Dale King. We co founded together that one. Sponsored disabled athletes, veterans initially, and then we became veteran-centric, including civilians, and we brought them to the Arnold and gave them opportunities to compete, uh, notoriety. Then we would give grants and money for them to go compete at other local competitions, build their own brand and name. And a lot of the main athletes that people follow today are the original, like Zach Rule, like Logan. There's a lot of guys out there that started on Team SAR that are now able to do their own thing. So it was a stepping stone for a Is lot there- of guys. Like good communication? Is it like a like kind of a, a community where there's been like some culture built so, up, or is it kind of done more from afar? Or it's kind of just like we've put ourselves up there and built it to where if you're an adaptive athlete and you're competitive, then you can write in, join the team, and have opportunities to compete. At this point, like it's we're not out there solicitating. It's not our style. Like you want to do it or you don't. <clears throat> And if you don't, awesome. Do what you do. But if you do, we're here for you. And it's because, look, man, like I am tired. Like I don't train people anymore because I'm tired of caring about other people's life more than they do. Mm. So it's like if you want help, it's there. If you want to be coerced into joining, like we're not the right nonprofit for you. Like somebody else will put you on a horse and clap for you. You mentioned also um, that, like, I think – you talked about living in the present, but then you also talked about like five and goals you have for like 20 years or whatever. Mm-hmm. What do you want? Like, to, like what do you see for yourself in the next 10, 20 years? What uh, do you want to be? Uh, to the do? president of the United States. Okay. Cool. I love it. <laughs> um, are you political in any way now? Like, are you involved in your community, state, you know, city? Anything like that? <clears throat> yep. Nation. Like, um, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 you have to be like 100 years old, though, to be president. No, like 36, <laughs> 20 years, 50. I could be done by 65 and enjoy the last 10 years, 15 years of my life. So you're our first president that we've ever had on a podcast. No, I'm not president yet. And I might not even get there, but like that's the goal, that's the like goal. To, t- to take proper steps to get there to actually represent like Congress is in the future. Dude, like, what about your past? So what? Everybody's going to have a past. Yeah, I don't know about years, though. Okay, I mean, fine. So what? You stand up and I do what Eminem did on 8 Mile and just <laughs> own all my shit? <laughs> Just, just throw it all I don't out know, there. Man. Like, hey, Trump, Trump did it, and like, we I'm got not some, saying that Trump's doing a good job. But what I'm saying is, we got some. Dirt. I haven't raped anybody. I haven't beat anybody. I haven't hit a woman. Like, what? You're gonna get mad at me for getting underage arrested a couple times for being drunk or getting into a couple bar fights when I was twenty something? Yeah. Cool. Whatever, man. Let's look at your shit. Let's talk about what you've done. And like, if people want to get into the weeds about, oh, well, he's this, he's that. Cool. What's he done lately? Because it's been nothing but nonprofit. But you got hand tattoos. Okay. Guarantee the girl that was nine that got hit by a car going 30, 40 miles an hour that I, I, I stopped and helped a couple of years ago gave no fucks about my hand tattoos. Mm. Zero. You know what? Not a single person in the world gave a fuck about my sleeve when I was in Afghanistan fighting. Like, right? So, like, okay, you guys can make it about some arbitrary thing about me, and that's fine. Don't vote for me because I'm disabled. Don't fucking step out because you don't think. But that's your fucking problem. Yeah. Don't vote for him because he's black. Right? Mm-hmm. Go vote for him because he's black. It's all bullshit. Yeah. People need to stop buying into the horse shit. And when they're ready, they'll elect people that are problem solvers. And that's when I'll run. Like, I'm not there to play dog and pony shit. Like, if that's how politics are going to be, then I'll be the guy that starts the fucking revolution. Because this is bullshit, and everybody knows it, and everybody wants it fucking fixed, and literally nobody knows how, because the system's just systemically broken. And now we're even to the point of questioning whether the system's being done properly. So what's the next logical step? Well, if you believe in the fucking Constitution, then it's pretty clear. So look, people will start taking their stuff responsible, they'll start like electing the proper people, and things will get fixed. And I have faith in that because this is America and that's what we do. 
What are some things that you'd like to see changed? You mentioned the VA earlier. Like, what are some things? Ha- has the VA been good to you? Has it treated you well? Has it been shitty? How, I don't know? go to the VA. I fly to fucking Walter Reed. Like the I've every VA I've been at, I've had to talk to the doctor or the president on some kind of administrative issue. That's just an oversight. And it's gotten to the point where I don't fucking care. I will change the VA from the department of VA level, or we will work with nonprofits to circumvent the system to ensure soldiers are getting the care that they want. And it's fucking sad and depressing considering the VA gets so much of our budget. But if that's what we have to do, if we have to make backdoor drug deals to ensure that guys that get their testicles blown off or, or whatever their situation is can have fucking kids. Fine. And if I'm sitting in a room full of politicians and they're trying to figure out a way to either be more inclusive with the ru- with the rules so they can be blanket for everybody and opens the door for health care, if I have to listen to guys talk about federal funds being used in a worst case scenario for too many egg implementations taking into too many eggs being implanted and taking taking in that you may have to do a removal. I, I'm not. I don't fucking care. It's not the same. Yeah. I'm not having that conversation. So we just find a backdoor workaround and guys will get it done through MTFs and there's an extra step, but it's not costing them 25,000 fucking dollars anymore. Is, is it safe to say that like most of the work that's being done for veterans right now is by former veterans? Like that the positive work that that's being done? For 100%. That's... Like, it's almost sad to think that without the Vietnam vets that the Afghan and Iraqi vets would have came home to nobody that gave a fuck. Like, and I'm not saying that civilians aren't appreciative, but like the Vietnam vets got spit on and accosted when they got back and they made damn sure that didn't happen to us. Yeah. And like, it's sad that the veteran community has to take care of itself because everybody that joined was made a promise. And the public enjoys a veteran volunteer force that steps up and does whatever it wants and then bitches about us doing it. Don't send us to fucking war if you don't want everybody fucking murdered. We're not a police force. Mm. I was a platoon leader for the 82nd Airborne. I was a broad sword. I didn't go into villages and knock on doors. I went into villages. The intent of the regular army is not to go into door to door and knock on people. Like our intent is to fucking devastate fucking cities and lay lay waste. Mm. So we're not fighting the wars that were intended. And you know what? That's way above my head and that's just a personal opinion. But at the same time, like, you don't fucking take a screwdriver trying to hammer in a fucking a painting. You know what I mean? It just doesn't make sense. And like, yeah, the special forces guys and the rangers guys and stuff are doing great shit and they're still operational, but their op tempo sucks and their personal lives fucking suffer. So like, yeah, we're a voluntary force and like, I don't think that the same outreach would have been there had the Vietnam vets not stepped up. And if somebody wants to have a conversation about that, I'd love to talk to them about it. I'm not saying that People haven't stepped up in the nonprofit world, but like, you know, it's been mostly vets for vets. How can uh, civilians maybe serve America better? To, to live lives worth dying for. Makes sense to me. Awesome, man. You shared a lot with us. I really appreciate it. Um, how can people find out more about you, find out more about your nonprofits? Uh, I'm on Instagram, Derek underscore Carver, D-E-R-I-C-K underscore C-A-R-V-E-R. Team Sound Assembly Required is on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and there's just some changes coming up in the near future. So look out for, you know, look out for that. And YouTube, personal website, and all that good jazz. So. It's coming. Instagram's primarily it right now. It's hard for me to get real deep into the social mm. media world. Do you have uh, Do you have different legs for like different things? Yeah, I hate this leg. This one's my learn how to walk again leg before I can get back to my. And you have like what? A, like a knee joint? Like a socket? This is it. No, I had osteo integration, so it goes directly into my femur. Now. Holy shit! So there's no more socket. Wow, that's what I meant by number twenty eight. Like, yeah, it's straight in. Like here, I'll and then you, you can you straight you can straighten the knee out. Like how no, you- I can't straighten it. I can control the bend. I can stand. The knee is on a piston system. So like, how do you stand with the other leg? You stand. No, there's a little bit of resistance and help there. So there Holy go. shit! So and this is this is just glue from the band. The band. Yeah. So you know. Yo. That's wild. You got a fucking piece of metal sticking out of your whole body. Yeah, bro. It's That's insanity. It in my entire femur. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So that's osteo integration. You know, they can look that up. There's there's a little bit out there, and this is a new experiment. I'm in the FDA study right now. Yeah, you, you said that you're like what 28 or something. 28, yeah, 34 ever, 28 in the study or something like that. Does does any of that system. does any of that hurt? Yeah, every fucking day, Mark. Yeah, take a step, it yeah. hurts. Stand up wrong, it hurts. I'm still on a cane after 10 years. The body mechanics is off. Like I don't have a quad or a hamstring, so my glute medial hasn't engaged. I just got my left glute to engage after 10 years. Like mm. my adductor and abductors are acting as ha- hamstrings or uh, quadriceps, and they're significantly underpowered. So like, there's a lot of like uh, disparity in the way they uh, they fire and the the weight of the leg and the length of the nub. When you go to stand up, does that side hurt when your body goes to like yeah, settle? It depends on leverage and temperature and like the step and the angle. Mostly angles <laughs> hurt. Pressure hurts and fatigue hurts. I what about f- the other side? Yeah, the same. I get swelling. Like I, you can't see any vascular. That means I'm holding a lot of fluid in my legs right now. Just my leg. Something you got to just try to manage all the time. Yeah, hydrochlorothiazide. Sometimes LASIK in emergencies, trying to get it off, just because you know it gets dangerous with DVTs and stuff. Like the right side with the scar, there's poor venous return. Yeah, and what about the skin and stuff? Is the skin? No, I don't have any. There's no feeling or sensation or temperature here. So like, it's just. You don't feel anything there. Nothing. I can like if they push super super hard, I can feel the bone. Your muscle. Oh, but like okay. you can feel like feel that right there. Oh wow! That's a piece of shrapnel that's just under my skin. That's about the size of a nickel. And they just left that in there because well, it's cool. It's right next to a vein, a nerve. So if they pull mm. it out, it could impact the way the leg functions. Yeah. And it's fucking cool. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pick up line in a bar. Yeah. Like, yeah, I got five of those. It's a fucking my... piece of a bomb in my yeah, leg. Yeah, and <laughs> my leg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey now so yeah I mean it's just like like I keep saying man like everybody's life is different and everybody's got like a different like there's a there's 8 billion people on the planet take 2 seconds and you can learn something from everyone like try to be a good person mm-hmm. and it's okay to be a shitty person just try not to live your life as a shitty person what about having a um, uh, having like a something like that a leg like that that is performance enhancing like a Years ago, it was like the Blade Runner dude or whatever. Yeah, that, for BKs. So there's a huge difference between AKs and BKs. BKs, below the knee amputees, guys like Casey Mitchell, like uh, there's a couple out there. Um, those guys, they, they lose some mobility and pivoting and they're missing a foot. Mm-hmm. But with that second knee, they're, 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 they're significantly higher functioning with more muscles. Mm-hmm. Think about the number of muscles between your hip and your knee joint. You guys talk shit back and forth. Uh, like, we call them paper cuts. Yeah. I mean, they're like, you know, yeah, like, well, come I mean, on, bro. Like, that's not that much. That I'm just a hater because I'm jealous of the dude's knee because I'd fucking, I'd, I'd give, I'd, I'd rather be a double BK than a single AK. I'd rather be missing both feet than missing one knee. And that's like, you can run in the Olympics missing two feet. You can't run in the Olympics missing a fucking knee. Mm. And that's just bottom line sign. And there's downsides to having being a double BK because they're in chairs and like I can hop and like, so there's, it's not all like, it's just like, what are you trading and what are you getting? When you're doing CrossFit, how, how were you able to, you know, like, were you able to? I just leg you, on, leg off. I haven't done CrossFit since the surgery. This you would, is brand you would, new in the last six, six months. You'd take it off pretty much for both. a lot of stuff. For It depends. Like if I did anything hanging, I'd have to take it off because there wasn't the length. Anything pressing, I would do it leg on. Anything over a 315, I... Uh, Anything over 225, I had to have both legs on to do it safely for reps. What kind of lifting cred you got? What kind of weights were you putting up at your strongest? <sighs> Bench, highest, like, recorded, 505. Um, seated deadlift, at, and, like, the the Brits was, like, 930. The fuck is a seated deadlift? It's, dude, it's, like, you're in a chair. It's elevated. There's either a straight bar or a trap bar, and you, you lift 18 inches. Dude, I need handicap lifts like this. Yeah, I'm telling dude. you. You think so, but it's all upper back. It's kind of it's a different approach. It's fucking too hard. It's, I do. I like it, but it's, I mean, yeah, but not, um, I can over it. So I was always a pressing guy. Like I can see, I like I used to see the dead press over 405. Holy shit. Um, I stand it. I did the Arnold one year and did 300 for two reps on a prosthetic. Yeah. What? Um, yeah, um, I can awesome. do three. Fi- there's videos on Instagram of three fifteen for five reps wow. standing. Shit. So and then like bench press, like fives, like fours all day. 
like 455. You're still pushing that now? Mm, I'm scared to go above. Like, I've done 315, uh, but I, this chest tear uh, was like, the, I mean, the yeah. tore in half, tendon came off both ends, bicep and tricep disconnected. Are you close to full? Do you, are you close Not to, even no. close. I'll never get, I lost 20% of the muscle and have a cadaver tendon. Like, so here's my chest, like when I flex, like, oh, all, like this is all, so like here's what my chest looks like. Yeah. And then here's what my chest looks like. Got it. So it's like from here to here is just. You no. Metal in your body. You got somebody else's tendon. I'm like, I'm like the six million dollar man that's like <laughs> Fuck, man. way over budget and doesn't <laughs> perform. <laughs> like we spent 12 and he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like hey, you're still holding it Negative together. one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's like the new Terminator I watched, and she's like, I'm augmented. So, like, that's, I'm just augmented. So, that's, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. You get it? I mean, what, what, yeah, dude, like, this is real life for some people. Take us out here, Andrew. Uh, make sure you guys hit us up on Instagram at Mark Bell's Power Project, at MB Power Project on TikTok and Twitter. Uh, mine personally is I, I am Andrew Z. Uh, thank you, everybody, that's been rating and reviewing the podcast. It's been amazing. I'll read someone's at the end of this one. But Nsema, where are you at? At Nsema and Yang on Instagram and YouTube, at Nsema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. And by the way, dude, that uh, last thing you said, live a life worth dying for, that shit's just stuck in my head right mm-hmm. now. I can't stop thinking about that, so... Yeah, we got work. We got fucking work to do. That's what that means. Shit, man. Uh, you know, I'm going to go back and listen to this show. I, don't, I never listened to the show, but I, I need to listen to some of this stuff and take some notes. That was, uh, that was fucking awesome. Thanks for sharing all that with us. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Catch you all later.